I'm delighted to be here with our first ever Facebook Live event for Kaiser Health News. Um, we hope we'll talk about all things aging, and my guest today is Dr. Lee Lindquist, who is the Chief of Geriatrics at Northwestern Medicine. Um, please um, write in your questions. We'll be happy to answer them, but I'll start with a question of my own for Dr. Lindquist. You talk about the last quarter of life. I think that's probably a concept that most people haven't thought about and certainly haven't thought about planning for. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, and thanks so much for having me, Judy. This is a very exciting event for us. Um, I'll tell you, a lot of my research is on keeping seniors aging in place and aging in their own homes in the community. And it's very important that we keep seniors as long as possible in their own homes. But what I see so many times is that seniors are not prepared um, or they don't plan ahead for what they'll need in order to age in place. And so I see people all the time, and these are patients of mine, I see seniors um, in my clinic, in my geriatrics offices, where seniors have planned for end of life. They've got their wills, they've got their trusts, they've got powers of attorney, they've got their caskets even picked out. But when I ask them, you know, what about the 10 or 20 years before they die? You know, what's going to happen if you need more help in the home? If you need somebody to check on you to get your mail to help you with, you know, getting groceries or doing your meals? You know, what's what about the 10 or 20 years before you die? And this sometimes is called the fourth quarter, uh, just because if you break down your lifetime into four quarters, this is kind of the years when you're 70, 80, 90, even in the hundreds. And people are like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do that. I'm, I just planned on retiring and then I'm ready when I, you know, pass away. But there's this giant gap that no one plans for. And so we at Northwestern Medicine made this website called planyourlifespan.org, um, which has been shown to be really helpful. And actually, we've done research on a, a controlled trial showing that it actually helps people with planning. Um, it connects people with services. It teaches you what decisions you need to make. And all around it helps you to communicate with your loved ones about what you'll need. Great. So this is going to be an interactive um, to and fro, and we're going to start with, um, we'll come back to that yeah, issue of totally. planning for the events that normally occur as you get older, but here's a question that's come in, so Let's why don't do we this. start with that. What do older patients need to know about anesthesia before surgery? The person who wrote this question said, my 72-year-old husband had a severe reaction to anesthesia a year ago and still has brief episodes of confusion. Is this a common issue? Well, you know what, I'm, it's, it's interesting that this question comes up because one of my colleagues um, who's now retired, he had open heart surgery, and he said, you know, when I had the general anesthesia, you know, even months and years afterwards, I still feel a little off. So we're seeing more and more people having problems with thinking after when they have like general anesthesia and so forth. So I always tell people this is one of those things where you actually have to ask questions. You have to talk to your doctors. Uh, should I be getting general anesthesia? Should I be getting local? Can this be done without even anesthesia, you know, or, you know, under a different type of sedation? So this is all things that you should talk about and consider, especially if you're a senior. What does the evidence show in terms of the impact of anesthesia on um, older adults? I think the verdict is still out um, because we need more people doing research um, on people that are over the age of 75. So, uh, you know, is anesthesia going to impact a person who's 70 differently than when they're 80 or 90? Yeah, I would assume so, but the data is still out right now. And should older adults ask for the least amount of anesthesia possible? What are some of the considerations as they think through the, this issue? What I usually tell my patients is to ask questions um, and see which matches their needs. So if you don't want to know anything that's going on, you know, if you're scared of the surgery, then maybe you should have something a little bit stronger. If you, you know, want to be awake, want to see your knee getting operated on, um, for instance, like my mom was told that she needed general anesthesia uh, on a simple knee surgery, but when I went with her, we talked to the anesthesiologist, and he says, oh, I could do it, you know, just with a block. Um, and she was much more happy with doing it that way. She's a teacher, and so she wanted to see it on the, on the TV screen, what they were doing with her. So, you know, it's really per person, um, and it's what matches the surgery. It's a matter of preferences. Mm -hmm. Another question has come in. My 81-year-old husband is a stroke survivor. He has physical and cognitive impairment. Should he see a geriatrician in addition to a neurologist? And this comes from Sally. Well, I am completely biased <laughs> uh, because I'm a geriatrician and chief of geriatrics, so I think geriatricians rock. 
Um, I would say that geriatricians do have use when a patient is being uh, with a stroke patient. Anytime people are having worsening physical or cognitive impairments, very good reason to see a geriatrician just because I feel like geriatricians kind of look at the whole picture. You know, can we fix cognition with, you know, more socialization? Can we help it, you know, by preventing falls if you've got a physical impairment? You know, are you on the right medicines? And I think that's something that comes up a lot is where you see these patients that have, you know, 15, 20 medicines that one, you know, three medicines are being prescribed by a neurologist, four medicines are being prescribed by a cardiologist, another two medicines are from a pulmonologist. And a geriatrician can kind of look through and say, these medicines are interacting, this is not a good idea, um, and kind of help you out. So my answer would be like, go see a geriatrician, we rock. So if somebody saw a geriatrician, mm -hmm. what could they expect in that first visit or the first couple of visits? So if you saw a geriatrician at Northwestern, which is where I work, um, what we'll usually have is uh, we'll do cognitive testing, we'll do, which is memory testing, you know, we'll check for your mood, we'll look through your medicines, we'll do gait and balance assessments. Um, and then we also have a great social worker that we work with who is phenomenal um, at getting people connected with resources that would really benefit them at home um, and kind of counteract any sort of isolation that they experience. Okay, great. Another question, yay. My 88-year-old friend fractured his pelvic bone but was sent home after 48 hours in the hospital because the doctor said he could take care of himself. He can't. What do we do? This is from Dorothy, the earlier than desired discharge issue. Yeah, so this, this actually happens. Um, a lot of times hospitals are trying to send patients home you know, as soon as possible. And personally, I like it when patients leave the hospital as soon as they can because the longer you stay in the hospital, the more um, bad things can happen. I mean, we've got a lot of you know, things that happen if people are stuck in bed too long, you know, if you know, they're getting medicines that might be more sedating, you know, if they're getting disoriented or delirium while they're in the hospital, these are all things that can actually worsen their lifespan. Um, so I'm a proponent of getting home patients you know, when they're able to and when they're um, ready to go home. My big thing on this one would be that I don't think that they actually did enough of an evaluation before he went home. So maybe even getting a geriatrics consult while the person is hospitalized or getting physical therapy involved or even social work involved when the person is hospitalized would have been the right thing to do. Um, but then here's always the fun thing, something falls through the cracks. And we've all known families, loved ones, where something falls through the cracks. You know, maybe the medicine didn't get prescribed or physical therapy didn't show up. And that's where I would tell Dorothy to contact the primary care doc and say, listen, this is not you know, happening. We need you know, services, we need stuff to come in there and they should be able to connect them with services. So I'm a little bit confused. Who, should the patient ask for social work, for physical therapy, for the geriatric consult? Yeah. They shouldn't wait for that to be prescribed by somebody else? No, 100%, 100%. <laughs> so okay, one of more my, about that. <laughs> yeah, one of my big things is that um, the senior probably is not going to be the one that asks because most people when they're sick in the hospital, it's just the nature of the beast. You're sick, you're laying in bed, you really can't be a good advocate for yourself. If you can, great. But usually it's a loved one who's like a, a patient advocate that's able to ask the questions and say, you know what, my dad is sick in the hospital, you know, he needs more help, let's get physical therapy consulted. Let's get a social worker in here to help get us services. Have you looped in my primary care doctor so they know what's going on? And these are things that, you know, on the first day a person is hospitalized, let's get physical therapy in there. And it's a very simple thing to say, I want this happening, can we get it going? And most doctors and nurses are, you know, are open to it, but there's so many other things going on that that might not be top of mind. So the final question on this yeah. is who do you ask? Who has the power to make these things happen for you? I would ask anybody, everybody, um, because you know, if you ask the med student who's working with you, they'll communicate it. If you ask the intern, you know, there's a chance that order will get written. If you ask the resident, if you ask the attending, if you ask the nurse, you know, just keep asking until it happens. And okay. that would be my best bet. Okay, great. Here's another question. My mom is, independent, is in independent living, 87 years old, but with numerous chronic medical conditions. Her primary care physician is not equipped to deal with elderly patients. How do I find the best geriatric primary care physician for an independent living elder? This is from someone um, in Minnesota, um, and I don't know if it's someone in a rural area, but there are a lot of rural area, areas in Minnesota and a lot across the country that aren't well served by geriatricians. So what would you say about this 
Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's it sometimes is hard to find a good physician who knows geriatric medicine or a geriatrician. Um, I know in the city of Chicago, there's about maybe 50 of us. Oh, wow. Um, which, if you think about the population of seniors in the city, you know, of Chicago, we could really use a lot more geriatricians. Um, the thing is, is that there's not as many people going into geriatric medicine as there are in some of the, you know, more exciting, you know, or, you know, well-paying, I guess, fields like cardiology or, you know, orthopedic, orthopedic surgery. <laughs> you got that one, Judy. Um, so you can just imagine you leave medical school or residency with loans, you know, you're going to pick something that's maybe a little bit more well-paying. And so there are fewer geriatricians than there are seniors that could benefit from them. That being said, um, you can actually go online to the American Geriatric Society and they actually have lists where you can type in your zip code. And that's the American Geriatric Society. And that you can actually just pull up their website and they'll have a, a list with zip codes of all the different geriatricians out there. Now I will tell you that sometimes people lose, use the term geriatrician, meaning that they take care of you know, seniors in general. But a true geriatrician is somebody who has fellowship training in geriatrics, meaning that they've done four years of medical school, three years of residency in either internal medicine or family practice, and then an additional one or two year fellowship in geriatrics. So um, that's something that you need to be an educated consumer when you're looking for a geriatrician. We might come back to that, but yeah. another interesting, a, a good question has come in. Um, so let's turn to that. It's about hospice. Hospice has the stigma that the end is near. Do you have any advice for what to say to a family member to convince them to consider hospice for their loved one, um, a family member who has a terminal illness and is pretty uncomfortable with the topic? Um, this is from Robin. Yeah, so that's a great question. So hospice is a very valuable service um, and kind of uh, group of services. And I always like to think of it more as a group of services where people can kind of come to your home, rally around you and help you. And so I actually, I've seen many of my patients that say, I don't want hospice. That means you think I'm gonna die. And then the patients get upset at you. And I'm like, no, no, no. Um, I actually like to reframe it, that it doesn't mean that I think you're gonna die tomorrow. It's because I want you to get more services and I want you to be more comfortable. And I think that's the nicer way of putting it because I'll even tell people, you know what, let's put you into hospice, see how it goes, you know, and you know, you'll be able to get stay at you know, stay at home, you know, have people come to help you with resources, you know, you don't need to leave to do things, you know, they can come to you and take care of your symptoms, they can bring you medicines to help you feel better. Um, there's a lot more services that are involved, um, many of which are free which everybody likes free services, let's be honest. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of how I'll sell it um, to people or reframe it. Um, and that being said, I also say, you know, sometimes people live longer than the six months or one year that people, you know, have been, you know, prescribed the hospice. And so you can actually leave hospice if you don't like it or if you, you know, get kicked out because you're, you know, still going. So it's not like it's the end. It's just a way of getting more services to you. Right. So I'm hearing it in terms of reframing it around their goals. Mm -hmm. You want to stay home. You want to be comfortable. Yeah. You want to have support. This will help you achieve, you know, those goals. And if it doesn't work, you know, it. You might as well try it, you know, and then if it's if it doesn't work, you can leave. One of the things that um, there was this study that came out last week about talking to seniors about um, cancer screening. Yeah. And, and, oh, I love that study. And, That's by Dr. Nancy Schoenberg. She's awesome. And people didn't want to hear, oh, we're suggesting that you not do the cancer screening because we think you're going to die in 10 yeah. years. It was like, we don't think it's actually going to help you. So a lot of people don't want the talk about their um, end being near in terms of framing things, mm -hmm. but they want it in terms of this either achieves your goals or it doesn't achieve your goals. That was my Yeah, take it was away a fantastic study and she actually presented it at the Society of General Internal Medicine at our annual meeting, so I got to hear it from the horse's mouth. She's a phenomenal physician, um, but the work was, it was a great um, piece and it was great research in that it shows just communicating differently. Um, and talking, you know, not framing it as, you know, you're close to death, so you don't need this. But like you said, you know, this is not really going to help you. You don't really need to keep doing this. And with my patients, you know, I have that same conversation. It's not because you're going to die soon. It's because it's not beneficial for you. Right. So, and family members can do that as well. Mm -hmm. A new question. My friend who has Alzheimer's has recently moved from home with her husband to long-term care. She is angry and agitated and restless. 
When she was at her own home, we would listen to music, create amazing art, and visit. Now my friend often asks me to leave. What do I do? Yeah, that's tricky um, because it's hard to say if the friend is worsening Alzheimer's, that's making her more confused, so she's forgetting her friend. Um, and then there's also the thing is, is this, is this part embarrassment or part pride because she doesn't want people to see her getting a little bit more confused. Um, one thing I've noticed is that when people, and this is some of the research that I've done at Northwestern, is that when people move into a new place, it takes them a while to kind of get better situated. Um, so there is this confusion right away. So they might not even be reacting logically which it sounds like this person may or may not be reacting logically. But what I always tell people is that if you want to keep their thinking going and you want to keep the Alzheimer's you know, as bay as, as much as possible, to try to keep socializing with them, to keep visiting, not to give up on them. You know, let's do some art projects. You know, let's keep going and don't let them isolate themselves because of embarrassment or pride or anything. Just keep being a good friend of that person and supporting them. The other thing, too, is that a lot of times when people move to different places, they start having different interests. So if maybe art was not, you know, was something that they did in the past, maybe taking them for a walk or going for a walk outside, especially if it's a beautiful day like it is today, you know, and, and getting them more exercise because that would definitely help their cognition. So is the research that you mentioned, was it specifically with people who, with um, dementia who transitioned to new settings? Yeah, what's interesting is that when people, for instance, the research that's most recently published was that when people leave the hospital the month after they leave or switch places and they, you know, move into a living facility or they move move into their own home, their cognition gets a little hurt. Is this against people with dementia? No, or? it's just an observational study. Okay, any, and, any and so senior any when senior, they make a yeah. transition? And so when they make transitions, their ah, thinking kind of changes. Isn't that interesting? And even among patients that are like going for subacute rehab, like after a hospitalization, we see confusion a lot okay. when people move into you know a nursing home. I work at a nursing home where, or a, a skilled nursing facility, and we usually see people very confused the first few days that they show okay. up. And you can imagine yourself, you're waking up at a new place, I mean, who hasn't woken up in a new, you've, you travel a bunch, Judy, when you wake up in a new hotel room, sometimes you're like, oh wait, where am I at? Right. And that can sometimes be extended when you're in a new facility and you're like, where am I at? This doesn't feel like home. Right, but the bottom line, I, what I heard you say for people with dementia is hang in there. Even hang in there, yeah. Right, because the worst thing for them is to become completely isolated. That's right, and I usually tell the, the people with Alzheimer's really can't change, but the friends need to keep pushing and not give up. And find a new way of being with that person. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, another question. What do you do if your parents won't let you into their health business? Is there a way to learn more? This is from Casimir. Yes, um, so uh, we have all had experiences where our parents don't want us to intrude in their lives. Um, or you know, at some level, their health care. I know this because sometimes my parents are like, "You don't need to know about this. I don't want to worry you," um, which makes us worry more as kids because <laughs> you're like, "What's going on?" Um, uh, you're like, "Tell me what's up." Uh, but the thing that I always, what I, what I have to do even with my own parents is I have to say, "Listen, I'm here to help you. I'm here to support you. Going alone is not a wise idea. To your doctor's appointments, bring a friend." And you know, I'm in my 40s, and I still bring with a friend. You do? You know, I do. Wow. I do. I know. <laughs> Shocker. Um, I bring friends with. Wow. Um, when it's a doctor's appointment where I need, you know, I need a second set of ears. Right. So at any age, I think you should be bringing people with you because what you may hear, you may miss things, or you know, you want to have another person kind of weigh in. And so, you know, if I'm taking people with me in my 40s, you know, taking your, you know, going with your parents when they're in their 70s or 80s is important, too. And but what so, if they say, no, we don't want you? Oh, man, that's tough. Yeah, then you have to be like, listen, I'm here to help. And what I always tell people is don't give up and just keep pushing and saying, I need to know, I need to be involved. Because if you want me to help you be more independent and continuing to be independent, this is not about hiding things. This is about making sure that we keep you as independent as possible. Right. I heard from somebody on the Facebook group that um, has started for Navigating Aging. Yeah. It was an older adult who said, what do we do about our kids 
who want to be so intrusive in our lives when we don't really want them making decisions for us. Do you hear that from patients? I do, and I hear both sides where, you know, the, the adult children say, I don't, I want more involvement, I want to know what's going on, and then we hear the seniors that say, oh, that one is just keep us on, keeps on bothering me and they won't leave me alone. But the thing is, you have to find a happy medium, and it's always a changing relationship because, you know, saying that you don't want any involvement and kind of cutting it off is not the answer. Um, you have to let them in just like they have to give them a little bit of leeway. But then, you know, over time, people do have to step in and step back, too. I, I like what you said about a changing relationship mm -hmm. and that the changes have to be taken, taken account of. Um, here's a question from Dan. How often do you find older adults and caregivers asking about how potential pa changes to public policy will impact their well-being? Well, I, I'll tell you, I mean... I've been in medicine for years and years and years, like over a decade or two. Um, what I find fascinating is that there's always changes to our healthcare system, um, but it's how we adapt to it. Um, and you know, no matter what people will get through Medicaid service, Medicare services, a lot of times we do have to pay out of pocket. Um, so will out of pocket costs ever disappear? No, I don't see that happening. I would say, you know, planning ahead, saving money. Um, and kind of working towards that and actually knowing what resources are available because what I see is that even without the changes in public policy people are not always aware of what resources are available and that's one of the things that we did that planyourlifespan.org website is that so people can go on it and actually see oh I didn't know I had an area agency on aging in my area that can give free meals or can provide homemaker services so there's these things that are available these resources but people don't even know that they exist yeah. so it sounds like people are more interested in the question of what resources are available than you know, t talk to me about Medicare and how it might be yeah. changing. Under... Medicare changes so much. You've right. seen this. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It, it, you get these update pages as physicians. You know, this week this is going on. This week this is happening. So we see changes all the time. All right, here's Kara, um, and this is a big oh. one. What's your best piece of advice for staying healthy as we get older? That is a phenomenal question. Do we have another question. ten minutes? <laughs> oh my God! No, no, no! I love that question. That's an awesome question because nobody wants to grow old poorly. Right. We all want to be successful agers um, and stay healthy as we get older. And um, my two caveats, I would say, is, you know, make sure that you're seeing your doctor, following up with the health care needs. Um, my other thing, too, is exercise. Exercise is so important. Um, you know, going out and doing Tai Chi, going out, you know, joining a walking group. Um, and this was something that with my own family, um, my parents were getting more isolated because their friends had moved away, you know, they're by themselves in a large house. And so I said, you know, you guys have to sign up for Tai Chi. Tai Chi is one of the best exercises for seniors because there's long-term studies now that show that it's good for your brain, for cognition, as well as for balance. So I signed up my uh, like six foot four tall dad to uh, Tai Chi class. Um, out in the suburbs of Chicago, and he goes religiously every week with my mom. So the thing is that you need to keep exercising, you need to keep pushing yourself, taking uh, classes, and kind of going outside of your norm um, and challenging your brain. Um, one of the, th the things I tell people is if you think about your brain as a muscle, the more exercise you give it, the more thinking you do, participating in Facebook Live events, um, that's another way of keeping your brain active, uh, but these are all ways to keep your brain muscled up. But doesn't research show that the more things new that you do, the, um, the better the impact on cognition? Yep. Right. Yeah, it's not so. the same old thing you've been doing. If you've been doing New York Times crossword puzzles for the past 15 years, try something different. Yeah, exactly. Sudoku, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Judy, no, she's awesome. <laughs> so it's totally true. Like the more challenging things you can do to your brain. And if you think about like the muscles in our body, you know, uh, if we sit down all day, you know, then they're just going to go to, you know, to jello. Um, and that's the same thing. If you live in a house and you've got four walls and you don't leave those four walls, that kind of becomes a nursing home at some level. So the more things you can do, the more things you can challenge yourself. Um, one of my patients who was awesome and I love her, uh, she says, every day I go outside and I try to meet or talk to one new person. Hmm. And if you think about that, that's phenomenal to keep, you know, isolation at bay and to keep exercising your brain. All right. Um, I think we'll probably get back to that, but here's something from Mike. 
Um, are there exercises that you can recommend for building balance? Yes. Oh, good. So, uh, what are they? So Tai Chi, actually. That's ah. why I was like, yay, Mike, good question. Um, so Tai Chi is really good on building balance. Um, it's a repetitive action that actually keeps your balance uh, on focus. So people that do Tai Chi, they've done studies that show people are less likely of falling. Um, and that people, you know, have better cognition over time by doing Tai Chi. So I would say, you know, call up your senior center, see if there's any Tai Chi places in your neighborhood. And there's been some places where there is no Tai Chi. So people will say, I'm going to get a Tai Chi group together. We're going to start going to the park um, or even getting, you know, videos online or videos, you know, through, you know, CDs, etc., DVDs and playing them that way. Um, other things, simple things is, you know, every time there's a commercial on TV to stand up. Um, sit down, stand up, sit down. The less time you spend sitting, the better your balance will be. So mm. even cutting back on sitting by five minutes in an hour is better. Wow. So that means you and me should be standing up now, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're watching this, we'll stand up, you guys. <laughs> yeah, everybody should be standing up right now to work on their balance. Here's another one. I am a paid caregiver, and my client's daughter is asking me, is it time to put her mother into an Alzheimer's unit? My client has five caregivers plus her daughter. At what point in the progression of the disease is it time for a change? That wow, person, I there's know. a lot in that question <laughs> that the, the daughter is asking the caregiver. Yeah, right? so this is a tricky one to unpack because um, it sounds like they've got five caregivers, which is, is incredible. Um, anyone who knows caregivers, you know, they're very expensive for one, but to have five, wow. Um, so you can tell the daughter is very involved um, I try to keep people as long as they can in their own home. Um, and I think when people need to be moved to a, you know, like an Alzheimer's unit is when they're starting to get violent or they're not able to be controlled in their own home without endangering other people. What does that mean, controlled so, in their own home? Meaning like, you know, you can distract people like, oh, hey, don't, don't start throwing that toaster. Why don't you come over here and, uh. and talk to me, you know? So we can distract people. Sometimes we can use medicine to kind of control some of the issues going on. But that's with regard to violence. What would be other reasons to um, uh, Violence put some... is like the big thing. Sometimes size, um, you know, if you've got a six foot four, six foot six tall guy, um, you know, who's hard to move, you know what I mean? And you can't get the resources to move them around. Sometimes that happens. Um, but more oftentimes than not, it's the violence okay. that gets people in there. Um, sometimes it's socialization, you know what I mean? If they want more people interacting with them or they need to be watched more closely. Are sleep issues a, a factor? Well, you know, with sleep issues, that's f interesting you ask me that because if you, this person has five caregivers, nobody with Alzheimer's sleeps well. It's always an interrupted sleep. So the caregiver during the daytime should be with the person and then the caregiver at night should not be sleeping. The caregiver at night should be keeping an eye on ah, them. Ah, okay. Um, and so, on that one, I mean, that person could completely keep going at home, but it depends on what the nature of their Alzheimer's or what things are happening with. I think the daughter is probably asking the paid caregiver because the paid caregiver spends more time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll sometimes tell the families, you know, spend 24 hours with the patient and see if you think they need to have more caregiver support or if they need more help. Um, instead of sometimes asking others, because then that paid caregiver kind of gets put in an unusual place. Right. Because if she says, yes, they need more support, then, then she's I'm out of a job. job. You know <laughs> right, how that works. Right. Yeah. But then uh, maybe part of the daughter's question is also, how do I even manage a situation where I've got my own family, I'm working, I've got five paid caregivers to look after, mm -hmm. you know, I might be overwhelmed and I'm asking somebody else, is there a possibility of some relief here? And truly, one of the issues with somebody going to a nursing home can be that the family becomes overwhelmed, right? It's so true. Yeah, that's an excellent point because sometimes if you're managing five caregivers, you become, you know, pretty much your own nursing home, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, or Alzheimer's home where you're making sure everybody's got their hours in and they're doing their duties. Um, I've seen some people, some patients have actually, some families have moved them into uh, like a, an Alzheimer's unit just because they wanted to spend more quality time mm. instead of managing, you know, this caregiver didn't come, this caregiver did came, this one needs to get paid. And it's less business-like mm -hmm. and more actually just having serious, just enjoying the conversation time. Right. Okay. Another question. I live and work in southeastern Arizona and I find the biggest issues are isolation lack of services, 
and lack of knowledge as to what services are available. And this is from Ramona. Yeah, so true. Um, and so what we found with our research on planyourlifespan.org was that there's so many um, people that are in isolation that don't know what resources are available. Um, and a couple of our partners were even in rural areas um, that we tested out the website because with the website, you can actually just type in your zip code and you can find where your, your nearest resources are. And then also people don't even know what's out there. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, could I get Meals on Wheels mm -hmm. or could somebody come to visit me? Mm -hmm. So the planyourlifespan.org website was created because this issue comes up all the time. Right. You know, and so we don't all have access to social workers, which I wish we all did. Right. Um, and so this allows people to kind of do it on their own time to look online and see what they can find for right. themselves or their loved ones. There's also another resource, Elder Care Locator, mm -hmm. which is national in scope and is a good resource. But let's talk about the issue of isolation. Yeah. Uh, especially of seniors who might live outside of, even within urban areas, but outside urban areas. and. What can people do about that? Yeah, isolation is tough. Um, one of the things that I'm finding more and more is that um, using the internet is really a neat way of kind of overcoming the isolation if you are in a rural area, you don't have a lot of people around you. Um, because ultimately you want to get out, you want to meet people, you want to see people. Um, but if you're three hours away from somebody or an hour away, you know, the internet's been phenomenal and so many of my seniors have been really good at getting on the internet and doing things. And what drives me nuts is when people say seniors don't use the computers, which is absolutely not true um, because seniors do use computers. We're seeing that more and more. So I would say, you know, any sort of way of getting over that social iso isolation, going out, meeting people, you know, joining a Tai Chi class or even going online, going on Facebook, going on Twitter, meeting people um, and doing it in a, you know, a, a nice way instead of, you know, watching out for all the bad stuff. But I think that's a way of people getting over it. And I think one of the issues with planning for aging is understanding that um, friends and family mem members are going to move away, pass away, and we have to invest in building relationships with um, people continually as we get older. It's yeah. not just sort of relying on the people who might have supported us during middle age, so we need to reach out to you know, to yeah. that person who we meet, you know, in a new class. It's true. And um, diversify, as it were, our, our social networks. Yeah, very true. And in my dad's class, my mom's class, is that they've got all friends and they want to meet up with them every week. And oh, they, they make new miss friends. It. Yeah, so oh, they okay. can't miss their classes because they have to meet up with their friends. Um, but it's so important to get past that isolation. And the other thing, too, is that when we see people getting older, we sometimes don't reach out to them. And so mm -hmm. I would even tell the younger generations, you know, if you see a senior walking down the street or, you know, you know of a senior neighbor, reach out to them and say, hey, you know, do you want to come over and watch a movie together? Or do you want to come over and have dinner? Um, so being more inclusive of the seniors in our lives mm -hmm. instead of just saying it's an old person that lives down the block. Right. It's an other who we don't really associate yeah. ourselves with. Okay, a new question. Why are preventative care services for dental, vision, and hearing not covered in your basic Medicare insurance package? This would make such a difference in the lives of Medicare patients and would prevent other medical issues from arising. This comes from Robin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to what? So I, yes, um, it bothers me as a geriatrician that dental, vision, and hearing are not always covered by Medicare. Um, are yeah. routinely not are covered. Routinely. Yeah. yeah, and I think the thing is, is that I think it's something that is so vital to seniors is, you know, eating, you know, let's using our teeth, you know, seeing things, hearing things, because many times your cognition will get worse if you can't hear or you can't see, because then you don't get the input, um, and so therefore you won't be able to remember it. Um, so yeah, do I think we need to do better as a country in paying for dental and vision and hearing? Yes. And in fact, one of my columns is going to be on um, dental care for seniors coming up. But let's talk about a related issue, which is the um, preventive services that are available through Medicare, the annual wellness visit, for instance. Oh, yeah. Let's talk so about that. I was like, yeah, good thing, Judy. Um, so just uh, I'd say in the past few years or the past uh, couple years, um, Medicare is now reimbursing for an annual Medicare wellness visit um, and also a welcome to Medicare visit. Um, and you can definitely ask your physicians if you could have an annual well, uh, Medicare wellness visit. Um, and this is very 
good thing because it actually does the, your physician can actually bill Medicare and you can actually be tested for your cognition, for your, you know, depression, for, you know, function. Have you gotten all your shots? You know, have your vaccines gone on? And, you know, have they had, you know, end of life advanced care planning decisions? And so it's expanding and I don't think people realize how much more Medicare is able to cover with just that one Medicare wellness visit. And so. not enough people are taking advantage of those mm -hmm. Medicare visits, yeah. so ask your doctor. So from Kimberly, you mentioned sleep disturbance is common in Alzheimer's. However, is it also common in aging? My parents both have trouble sleeping. Yes, yes. I've it, been having trouble sleeping. Oh my God. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, an annoying thing that happens as we get older is that when we're younger, uh, we have these great dreams and we get plenty of, t we have, you know, very easy for us to go to sleep, but we don't have enough time to sleep because we're always working, getting around. When we get older, our sleep architecture changes. Um, what I mean by that is that you don't get into that deep REM sleep where you have those great dreams as much. Mm. Um, and so if you think about how many more dreams you had when you were younger, and then how many more dreams you had as, you know, when you're getting older, um, people don't sleep as well and they have different sleep patterns as they get older and that's a normal process of aging. So a lot of people will say, oh, I need a sleep medicine, I need a sleep medicine. And we, as a society, I think, look to medicines to fix things. Um, but one of my things is that the sleeping medicines out there um, are not always the best for seniors, um, primarily because they sometimes will stay longer in their body um, so what I usually look at as a geriatrician is telling my seniors, you know what, how many naps are you taking during the day? Because I see a lot of my seniors taking naps during the daytime hours, and then they say, I can't sleep at night. And then they spend a lot of time sitting down during the day, so then they're not tired at night. So what I like to do is I like to say, you know, no more than one hour of nap a day in the you know, daytime hours, and then they have to exercise more. So I think exercise is a fantastic way to get over insomnia because you get so tired during the day doing physical therapy, doing exercise that you sleep better at night. Hmm. Um, Did that put you to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I'm <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good advice. Um, and let's talk about sleep hygiene. Yeah. Just before we go on to the next question, because there, those are things that people can do as well. Do you recommend that? Yeah, so no coffee at night, you know, kind of limiting your fluid intake so you're not up all night peeing. Um, there's some people that have done, or there's research out there that shows that if you can correct um, peeing at night, then you can correct sleep. Ah. Um, and then also, if you ever hospitalize, we see a lot of times people have day-night reversals mm. where they'll sleep all day because, you know, they're up all night getting blood tests. Mm. So, you know, that's something to be aware of. So when, if you're ever hospitalized, try to stay awake during the day. Um, no matter what, if you can. Okay. Um, from Mary, any advice for when your elderly parents would really benefit from being in an, in an assisted living facility, but they refuse? Let me just say before you answer, I'm sensing a common theme here, which is how do you talk to your parents about these kinds of issues? Um, so um, this one's specific to assisted living. Yeah, and I'll tell you, so I have an MBA from Kellogg at Northwestern with, uh, for negotiations. I didn't know that. Yeah, I know, <laughs> go figure. Um, so I negotiate a lot with my senior patients and their families. Um, what, I, what I usually tell people is that um, you kind of ask them, when I talk to my seniors, when do you think you'll need to have more support? And if they say, oh, well, when I forget doing this, or I forget doing that, or if I need help doing that, then you can easily come back to them and say, well, mom, you are having problems doing that, so now we need to talk about getting you more support because you've already kind of set the, the bottom line of when they'll need support. Um, and I actually would say it's kind of a two-way street because you know, not everyone is gonna be embracing an assisted living facility. You know, sometimes people feel like I'm just going there, you know, it's death's waiting room. I've heard that term. Um, other people say, oh, it's great because it's like a dorm living. You know, I've got a lot more exercise. I got a lot more, you know, activities going on. So it really has to match the person. Um, and what I've also seen too is that different communities have different kind of styles. You know, some are more active, some are more kind of relaxed. So it's finding a good fit for them and then also kind of empowering them to make the decision. Um, so, you know, like, let's go shopping, let's look around at places, see if any of these look good to you, you know, or do you wanna stay in your home? If you do, let's interview some people that can kind of help you out. So it's giving 
the senior kind of the choice and the decision and kind of empowering them. I want to go back to what you said about that question. When do you think you'll need more support? Yeah. So you, you ask that with your patients. Yeah, I, I do usually... Do you think that's a conversation that uh, adult children should be having with their parents? I do. I love that question. And I also ask the, where do you think your memory is? Uh, because really? then if people say, oh, my memory's perfect, you know, that's, you know, questionable. But if they say, you know, I am having some memory loss, I know it, then I can kind of build off of that and say, well, you know, where are you struggling with? When do you think you'll need support? And so that's a, that's a question that, you know, people can ask. When do you think you'll need support or when do you think you're going to need to move out of your house or get help? What I always, the question that, the response that I always have a problem with is people say, I don't need any help. I plan to die in my own home without any help in my bed at night with by my, you know, in my yes. sleep. So how do you handle that? And that is completely, you know, that is just the wrong response because that is not, for the majority of people out there, that's not what happens. So what do you say? So you say that's not practical. That's not being realistic. This is what is going to happen. Um, this is what may happen. And when we were developing the planyourlifespan.org website, we actually put videos of seniors who've lived through this and said, you know, I thought I would die in my own home without any help, but instead I got hospitalized, I fell. So actually hearing it from other seniors can help ah, too. I think that's a really great idea. Um, Megan wants to know, my 70-year-old mom is very fit and active, but I worry about osteoporosis and fractures if she falls. Is there anything that can be done to strengthen bones in our 60s, 70s, etc.? Will diet, supplements, medications, or exercise help at this age? So this is a, it's a good question because nobody wants to fall on fracture because that's a terrible thing when a person falls, fractures, gets hospitalized, needs rehab, and that kind of is the a crisis that happens. Um, and so the more active she can be, the better. So the more exercise she can get, and it sounds like she's very fit, she's very active, Megan. Um, some things that I like telling my seniors, especially if they have osteoporosis, is to do more strength training. And that's one thing I've noticed with a lot of my seniors is that they don't always incorporate strength training or, you know, light weights or even, you know, pushing themselves on their weight um, lifting. I mean, I don't mean them to be like, you know, 400 pounds, woo, you know, um, but like, you know, more weight training um, can actually help with the bone growth. Um, there's some people that say that, you know, using supplements, calcium supplements may not be as good as even getting it naturally in your diet. So, you know, more yogurts, more cheeses. Um, but I actually like the exercise model and I like getting the, you know, more strength training for our seniors. There's a big push now I've noticed on the part of um, several organizations to say that osteoporosis drugs are underprescribed and should be more heavily prescribed. Do you, what do you think about that as well as the pre osteoporosis? I'd say it's per person. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's some people that, you know, may benefit from drugs that aren't getting them for osteoporosis. Um, there's more research out there that says that people may not need to be on osteoporosis medicines more than five years. Ah. So some people are getting them taken off, which they should be. Um, and then, you know, I'd say the best thing for everybody is to get calcium in their diet and then also to do some strength training and exercise and then talk to your doctor and have a, a genuine conversation about, you know, your future and osteoporosis and, and, you know, getting scanned. Great. I realize I've been absolutely negligent. This is Judy Graham. I do the um, Navigating Aging column for Kaiser Health News. And my guest is Dr. Lee Lindquist, Chief of Geriatrics at Northwestern Medicine. Um, we have a new question here. Um, what food items should we be including in our diet more as we age? What do you think of calorie restriction as an anti-aging strategy? And this is from both Megan and Liz. I hate calorie restriction because I'm a Chicagoan who likes to eat. Pizza. Oh my God, pizza and sausage uh -huh. and like cheese, you name it. So <laughs> I am the poster child for not doing a calorie restriction. Um, I like That's bread not too. a serious answer though. Oh, no, it's not. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, I actually, there's been research that have shown that calorie restriction actually does help um, decrease aging in mouse models is what I'm aware of. Um, there might be more research on that. Um, one of the things that I have a problem with is that calorie restriction actually makes people lose a lot of weight. Ah. So weight loss among seniors is deadly. Um, unless you're like super obese. So I hope Megan or Liz is not 300 pounds. When we say seniors, are we talking people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, or is there a specific age group that weight loss is specifically a so concern for? So I would for? say my concern is that in my clinics or in my geriatric offices, I see patients who are 86 pounds. 
um, f you know, five foot tall, 86 pounds. And that is a scary thing for me. And it's scary for them too, because if you get hospitalized, you're gonna lose five pounds um, just because of getting sick, you know, having meals taken away from you. And then as you lose more and more weight, like if an 86 pounder goes down to 81 pounds, you know, that person is so at risk of having, you know, if they get a bad flu or if they pick up an illness, their immune systems are not as charged as somebody who is not as thin. And so I'm constantly fighting. So being thin is compromising in terms of your immune function? I'd in say when age? you're in starvation mode. Okay, when you're in starvation yeah, mode. Yeah, when mm -hmm. you're in starvation mode, um, which sometimes people will do when they're in kind of a calorie restricted diet. A mm -hmm. lot of the studies on calorie restriction go down to like 400 calories a day, which is insane. Do not do that. Um, and what I see too is that a lot of seniors will lose weight because their physicians may or may not be the most informed on taking care of seniors. So they'll have like a 90 year old on a high fiber diet, a low salt diet, low fat, uh, you can imagine low cholesterol, um, and a diabetic diet plus a renal diet. And so then the senior starts losing weight and then they come to me and they say, my mom or dad is losing weight, you know? And I'm like, well, first of all, this is too restrictive of a diet. We need to kind of look at this diet and see what we can do because that is not gonna help them in the long run, especially when somebody's in their 80s or 90s. Um, and getting back to that question, is there specific foods that are better for you or worse for you? You know, it kind of changes, you know, over time. Sometimes this food is supposed to be better for you. Sometimes this food, you know, it's in the news that this is better for you. I usually tell people to try to eat a balanced diet. Moderation is fine. Um, you know, you can have a piece of pie now and then, you know, it's not gonna be deadly. Um, and I don't really like the calorie restriction unless you're, you know, morbidly obese. Lots of fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables is sometimes hard for seniors to get ah, in them just because of the chewiness of it. Okay. Um, applesauce is, you know, good too. Um, but yeah, if people can eat vegetables, fruits, that's good too. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm desperate for help on how to co-parent, how to co-care for an elderly parent with Alzheimer's with my sibling. He manipulates, isolates, and controls our mother. He convinced her to give all control to financing, all, he convinced her to give all control to finances, et cetera, to him without the proper protection of a power of attorney. What do I do? I just have to say this is an issue that several people have written to me about, which is an abusive relative taking advantage of somebody with dementia and how do you handle it? Yeah, well, I mean, we see this in our, in our, in my practice, in my geriatric practice where, you know, somebody will say a family member is, you know, doing these nasties, you know what I mean, or taking away stuff. Um, usually on those, I'll actually involve um, the state guardian's office mm. or I'll actually involve like an area agency on aging to do like a well-being check. Mm. Um, and you can find your area agency on aging either through Plan Your Lifespan or eldercare.gov. Um, and can a person request an elder check? Yeah, so anyone can call you know your area agency on aging and ask for a senior well-being check. Um, sometimes it happens sooner than later depending on how well staffed your agency is, but then they can go there and they can see if the person is being you know, abused or, you know, financially exploited. Um, and it's always tricky because when you've got siblings that one may be doing better than the other, there has to be some obvious fraud, you know, or obvious, you know, lack of care or neglect. Um, and so that's a little tricky. I would say on this person, document everything, put everything in memos, you know, if you can go with to the doctor's visits, that's another way of saying, you know, I'm participating in my, my parents' care. Um, but at the end of the day, you may need to get um, legal involvement just to kind of get things cleared up um, and may even need to go down the guardianship route, which is another thing that I've seen people have to do. Have you come across a lot of conflict between siblings in terms of um, the care of a parent, not just the financial yeah, side of things? Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that siblings um, are out to do harm. I think they both have the best interests sometimes in their mind. It you know, may not blend with each other. Um, but what I sometimes will see is that if we can bring in both family members and maybe educate them, and this is what I'm really blessed to have a great social worker, is that we'll have like a family meeting where we'll say, listen, we're all on the same page. We want to do the best for mom or dad or grandma or grandpa. Let's figure out how we can work this together. Um, so if you don't have a social worker like a family counselor to bring them in to have a discussion, um, because ultimately your goal is to help the senior or your you know elder parent so let's work together on that 
Um, maybe more on that later, but yeah. here is from Lurvin. I'm the health reporter for the Daily Sun newspaper in the Villages, Florida, a 55 plus community, and many residents tell me that they don't know how to wade through all their options. What can older adults do when there's a saturation of services? How can they tell what's good and what's not? Well, the Villages is a remarkable place where, I and know. having a saturation of services, we should all be so lucky but how would you help? Yeah, and whoever this is, definitely reach out to me by email um, or through planyourlifespan.org at northwestern.edu because we have tried to partner with them because it's a large senior community in Florida um, that's very senior populated. Um, and so I would love to do research with you guys down there. Um, but the thing is, is that it's it's kind of a vetting that they're looking for. Yeah. And I'd say word of mouth. I'm always interested in seeing you know, is there going to be a Yelp review system for services down in the future? Mm -hmm. So I think this is kind of in the making of, you know, figuring out what to do in the future as far as vetting them and such like that. So word of mouth right now, if you want to do Yelp reviews on people. But, yeah, that's a, a rarity to have saturation of services. Right. But the, the reality is there aren't a lot of good ways to tell who's reliable or not currently. No. With, um, without, I mean, there... Um, in terms of those kinds of services? So for home health companies, they actually are federally regulated. So you can actually go online and figure out which ones are the good ones or the bad ones. Same with skilled nursing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, but more than that, there's not really a large um, database of good ones or bad ones. Better Business Bureau is another one to go to um, right. just to figure out if they're good or bad. But it sounds like word of mouth, you know, given the fact that probably many of these services are new, might be the one to go to. Yeah. So here's an interesting question. Um, it's from Karen, 74 years old, who lives in a retirement community. She's been asked by officials here to des designate a health care power of attorney. I don't know where to begin, she says. Residents here all seem to have family or close friends nearby. Who's going to make decisions for me? This is a real issue for a lot of people, yeah, right? Yeah, and there's a new term out there that are the adult orphan. I don't know if you've heard this one or not. Yeah, um, I have. And I'm not I, sure I if really I like, like the, it. Yeah, no. I'm like, I don't know if I really like it or not, but it's for people that don't necessarily have relatives anymore and how sometimes it's hard for people to find people to make decisions for them down right. the road. Um, so I say on this one, if you don't have family or close friends nearby, you know, let's say you live in Chicago and, you know, your daughter lives in Alaska, you can still have your daughter be your power of attorney um, because we're so well connected nowadays with cell phones, with emails and stuff like that. So that's being close in proximity doesn't necessarily negate or mean that the person can't be your power of attorney. Um, if you don't have a lot of relatives or if you don't have anybody that you would want to pick, um, sometimes I'm seeing people hire a geriatric care manager or a designating, you know, like a lawyer to kind of manage the care when they're gone. And I think it's important that this person does pick a health care power of attorney because if something happens, you want to make sure that they know what you want. Mm -hmm. um, I know myself when I've worked in the hospital, you know, we've had patients that have come in that they actually designated their dentist as a power of attorney really? um, because that was their closest friend, you know, because the, they were having a lot of work done and they just knew the person. And wow. so, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, uh, you know, a daughter that lives in the same city. You know, it can be a daughter far away. It can be the closest friend, you know, or it could be a colleague. Although when I reported the story, um, the column I did on um, allies, mm -hmm. one of the issues that um, the older adults that I spoke to brought up was I want somebody who's in this place who can be at my side immediately and who can help sort of me, me navigate through the system where I happen to live. That's different from a power of attorney. That might be somebody who you know you can count on locally. And the people who I spoke with just talked about, you know, going up to friends, people they'd known for a long time. In many cases, they were coworkers who they had had relationship with over years, but they had retired. But they remembered that this was a reliable person, and they called them up and said, would you do that? Will you be there for me? Not necessarily, will you be my power of attorney? But if I need help, can I call on you? We call that being an ally. Yeah, and that was yeah. an excellent article. If you guys haven't read it yet, it was fantastic. <laughs> it's true. So I agree. Like The ally is somebody that you should definitely bring with to your doctor's appointments. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a power of attorney, or it can be, but you definitely need to have an ally in your building or you're around you. And yeah. sometimes you just have to reach out to somebody and sort of put yourself out there and say, I know I'm going to need help. 
will you be there for me? And, and all of the people who I spoke to who had done that were pleasantly surprised. The other person said, yes, of course, I would yeah. like to do so. And I'm always surprised why people, especially seniors, are so afraid of asking. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, because I'm, I'm always telling people, you know, go out and ask, you know, go ask a friend. Well, you had told me about this project that you're um, doing uh, on asking for help. Yeah, so a lot of times people are kind of fearful of asking for help or they're kind of worried, I don't want to ask for help because it's going to put them out. But, like, it, you should be able to ask for help. And, you know, like, this is something that people are expecting that they're willing to help you. So I think just getting over that hump of I don't know if I should ask, I don't want to impose or burden but that's what kind of being in a community is all about, is asking people for help and being there for each other. So um, here's another question. Um, how does a family pick a nursing home to care for parents with unusual medical conditions? My mom had a feeding tube, and the nursing home had no idea how to deal with this. I think it led to her death. Yeah, that's unfortunate, because um, you never want people to have bad thoughts about their loved ones when they're, you know, aging. Um, and having medical issues. Um, the If you're looking for a, a, a good nursing home, nursing home industry is actually federally regulated. Um, so Medicare does these um, kind of, or federal regulators actually do these visits to nursing homes to check on them and give them quality ratings, which are then publicly available on the computer. So you can actually Google it. Um, it's, uh, I think it's like medicare.gov slash nursing home compare. And actually it gives you, and then you type in your zip code and it actually shows you all the different um, nursing homes in your area and it gives you the star quality. And what I also find fascinating too is it gives you everything that they've been written up for, whether it's like an underboiled egg or, you know, the room wasn't painted right. You but know? should all so, nursing homes be able to deal with somebody with a feeding tube? You know what, it really differs. Or is there only a subset of yeah, nursing homes? Yeah, you know homes? what, um, I'll tell you, the patients that we're getting in skilled nursing facilities are getting much sicker. Um, so, you know, we're getting people with multiple tubes and stuff like that. And you really want a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility that's a good fit. Um, so you don't want to put somebody in a place that doesn't have the skill set to take care of a person. Um, you want it to be a good fit. How would you figure that out? I mean, the nursing home compare ratings won't really tell you that. Well, it'll tell you, you know, like staffing ratios. You know, is there a lot of people there? You know, is it a high quality place like a five star versus a one star? I like to tell people to go visit them. You know, and if you are not satisfied with it, talk to the administrator. If you are, you know, worried about things or things are kind of concerning, then take them out and move them. I mean, a lot of times people think you're stuck there once you move there, but people can move in and out of there just like they move out and out of apartments. Yeah, that's a, it's a difficult topic and one um, worthy of further exploration. We've got about five minutes left. Um, let's head to another question. Can you offer some tips for discharge planning from the hospital? When my mom was discharged a year ago, the planner was a nurse who was not familiar with her case. So I think this goes along with, and this is a great question, this goes along with having an ally or having you know offspring or children with you. Because um, when you're in the hospital, you're not gonna be, th the senior's not gonna be thinking straight 100% of the time just from being sick. So, I mean, even when I've had relatives, I, I'm there you know, helping them out, going through the discharge instructions, asking questions what medicines need to be changed, what medicines should I be taking. And then what I always tell people is call your primary care doctor, you know, the day you, you know, you get home or the day after you get home, pretty much within like 48 hours, um, just so that they know that you made it home. These are the medicines that they told me to be on. Is this right or not? And then to schedule a follow-up appointment. And I usually like to tell people to get on your physician's um, schedule like within a week because you need to be checked because things happen in the hospital. You're still kind of sick when you're getting home. Nobody leaves the hospital feeling perfect, um, but this is where you need that good follow-up um, with your regular primary care physician. How about um, some other issues like what is my recovery going to look like? Well, you know, there's a kind of like a rule of thumb in geriatrics that um, we always play with that for every day a senior is hospitalized, it sometimes will take about two weeks to recover. Oh function. My I know. Wow. So, and you know, this is just a rule of thumb that's been passed down for years and years. And it actually really is, it's, it, we see it a lot where you're sitting in bed for day in, day out. Um, and then you get home and your mind says, you know, I can keep going and doing what I normally am doing, but it does take a while to recover. And that's the critical time where you need to ask for help. You need to look for support and you need to 
be, you know, thankful. Hey, I've got people that can come help me. So you want to know what medications should I be taking? Mm -hmm. Which medication should I stop? Uh, what will my recovery look like? Um, what kind of services am I going to need in the interim? Yeah. Are they going to be there when I get home? Do I need... Exactly. And that's where it's important to have the ally or even your child or your adult children or somebody involved um, mm -hmm. big time and then to loop in the primary care doc. And how about being trained in what you need to know to take care of the person medically? It, w take care of yourself or have somebody take care yeah. of you? It's a great point. And I usually tell my families to say, you know, come in the day before and kind of figure out what I need to know before they go out. But okay. Um, Oh my gosh, last question. Few psychologists or psychiatrists accept Medicare. How do we get Medicare beneficiaries? How do Medicare beneficiaries get treatment for their depression? I know, I know. So, you know, people need to find services. It's always tough to do, and I know we're running out of time, um, but I would say keep pushing. Talk to your primary care doctor. See if there's social workers that can help connect you to services. Um, and also some home health companies offer um, psychology or psychiatry services. Um, so, you know, there's multiple angles to get around it, but depression is, needs to be treated. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending our first Facebook Live chat with Dr. Lee Lindquist, Chair of Geriatrics at Northwestern Medicine. And I'm Judy Graham. I write the Navigating Aging column for Kaiser Health News. Yeah, I, thanks, Judy. You thank did an you. awesome job. <laughs> Yay!